Columbia Broadcasting System presents One World Flight. You are listening to Muslim prayers coming from the loudspeaker system of the Muhammad Ali Mosque in Cairo. As heard above the cheering of thousands of Egyptians on the day last summer that Britain returned the famous citadel to Egypt. This historic recording is among several authentic sounds and voices transcribed inside Egypt and India to be heard tonight on this eighth of a series of 13 broadcasts based on Norman Corwin's 37,000 mile global tour as first winner of the Wendell Wilkie One World Flight Award. Norman Corwin. On the 9th of last August, in the holy Muslim month of Ramadan, the Union Jack that had flown over Cairo's ancient citadel for 65 years came down, and the green flag of Egypt was raised by its King Farouk. The act was a symbol of Egypt's independence from the British, and it was cheered by a throng gathered in a square below the citadel. That night, both the citadel and the Muhammad Ali mosque behind it were floodlit. A great searchlight, the kind used during the war to spot aircraft, was trained on the flag. The evening was clear and warm with exhalations from the African desert stretching away on all sides. The celebrants seemed to cheer every stirring of the flag in the breeze that came off the swollen Nile. And as though to contribute to the vivid mixture of ancient and modern, which is Cairo, an airplane came up from nowhere and flew low over the scene. For a moment, its motors obliterated the voice of the muezzin chanting praises for Allah on the public address system. On a rooftop in the neighborhood of the citadel where we had set up our CBS recording microphone, a group of Arab women sang with an abandon that seemed to go along naturally with a bizarre setting of minarets, airplanes, floodlights, domes, cupolas, cheering, and amplified prayer. It was all colorful and wonderful under the amber moon of Ramadan. Everybody seemed gay and animated. Certainly the celebration of independence is a joyous occasion to any nation. But in the hot, bright light of the next morning, it was perhaps reasonable to ask what this independence represented. Independence of whom, for whom, whether the people who had cheered it last night would profit by it tomorrow, exactly what these people were, how they lived, what they thought, whether they had fears, hopes, ambitions. We set out, a few of us, to look for answers. Our party consisted of Lee Bland, who handled the recorder, George Polk, CBS Cairo correspondent, Marcel Hitchman, a writer who served as our interpreter, and myself. Our first stop was in Abdeen Square in the vicinity of the King's Palace, and I intercepted the first person to come along. He was a boy, better dressed than most to be seen on Cairo streets. I asked how many were in his family. What sounds at first like Godfather is the boy saying, I Godfather, and so forth. I Godfather, and Godmother, and God Sister, and Godfather, and God everything. All living in the same place? Yeah. How many rooms? Two rooms. He said he was a mechanic, that he earned 15 piastres a day, which is the equivalent of about 60 cents. In the following recording, you will hear questions by Polk and myself, the interruption of a small child standing nearby, and toward the end, the striking of bells in a tower of the Abdeen Palace. Uh, what sort of food do you eat? Me? I, 
I eat in the morning food and eat afternoon meat and something like that. Well, do you buy all this at 15, uh, 15 piastres a day? I take 15 piastres every day, yeah. You buy here with Finnish five piastres? How much? I take, I, take I take 15 piastres every day. I smoke the cigarette by five piastres and keep 10 in my home to get some uniform for myself. I see. You have to pay food and rent and yes. everything for 15 piastres yes. a day. That's yes. 60 cents a day that yes. you make, and you pay for all your family. How many children do you have? I have three children. You have three children. How old are you? Me, I am about 16 years old. You're 16 years old. Yes. You have three children. Yes, sir. He said he wasn't worried about anything. He said he had heard a rumor that the war was over, but he wasn't sure. He was somewhat better informed about American jargon, for he suddenly used the phrase hubba hubba. You've seen some American movies, huh? Yeah. Is that where you got Hubba Hubba? Hubba Hubba and Take It Easy. What else? <laughs> <laughs> who did you... Who said Hubba Hubba? Hey? Who, who did you hear say Hubba Hubba? American people who say Hubba Hubba. Well, I'm an American. I don't say Hubba Hubba. No, some soldier walk in the street to make Hubba Hubba, Take It Easy. Through Mrs. Hitchman, we next questioned a man named Abdu, who said he was a servant, earning seven Egyptian pounds a month, or about $21. I say that you're happy now of your life. He says, well, who is happy? Why are you not happy? Because everything is expensive. I asked what he thought of Egypt's independence, of the situation in Palestine, whether he knew the war was over. He said, I don't care about politics and about war. Who cares about these things? I asked whether he was at all interested in the world outside of Egypt, whether he would perhaps like to visit some other country. Where should I go? If there is work somewhere else, all right. But I mean, to go just like that, where? I see. Does he ever get to see a movie? He never went to a cinema in his life. Would you like to go to one? Why should I go? He said he had never read a book, that he never read newspapers, that he was not interested in these things at all. While this was going on, a crowd had gathered and there were rumbles of suspicion and hostility. I started to ask questions of an Arab in a long blue galabia, and he told Polk... He doesn't like this idea. He thinks it's an insult to his dignity. Other people in the crowd said they were afraid of being recorded. I asked what accounted for this attitude. Well, it's quite difficult to explain. First of all, it never happened to them before. And then their uh, technical knowledge is very <laughs> small. And they don't know what is this. And they think it's mixed up with some movie business. And uh, they just... Just now, especially, they are not very friendly towards foreigners. And uh, they are afraid of stating things definitely. They don't like people who ask them questions. They are always like that. You see, when people ask them questions, it generally brings trouble. It means there is a policeman who comes to ask them questions or things like that. Nobody ever asks them what they think. Egypt was the 11th country visited in our one world flight, and though we'd seen bad conditions in other countries, this, for a traveler heading east, was the beginning of really morbid ignorance, squalor, disease. To the eye, Cairo is attractive, both in its medieval and modern aspects. It's checkered with mosques and palaces, ancient walls, towers, domes. The old city has bazaars and narrow winding streets, the newer quarters along the river achieve a certain European colonial dignity. To the east, behind the citadel, stand barren hills, and beyond that, sandy desert. Just out of town, at the edge of the western desert, are the great pyramids, and in between, the Nile, tree-shaded, romantic, polluted, supporting life and agriculture along its banks, just as it has done since earliest history. In this austere land where so much of civilization was cradled, there is small tradition for one world, or for anything resembling democracy as we know it. The world of Egypt has been, by turns, Memphite, Theban, Syrian, Persian, Macedonian, Roman, Arabian, Turkish, French, British. Dozens of wars have swept up and down the Nile and have zigzagged across the deserts, and the only constant factor since the days of the pharaohs has been the depression of millions, the poverty the relentless ignorance. 
There are schools in Egypt, yes, for the better off. There are also, also health services of a sort. We were told about them. But as we went around the city, stopping ordinary Kyrenes on the street, there was little to show the effect of either education or sanitation. In a big square known as Madanis Melia, one of the newer and better sections of the city, we interviewed people at random one night. I asked a cook named Ahmed what he thought of conditions in the country. Uh, too many, too many people no work, too many people no eat, too many people uh, no money. Too many people no work, too many people no eat, too many people no money. When I asked him what he thought should be done about it, he answered that the government should open shops and factories in order to create more work. He said he was a monarchist because he read in the papers that the king wanted to improve Egypt. I then asked about his knowledge of politics. Have you ever heard the word fascism? No. You have not. Uh, have you ever heard the word Nazi? He says no. no. He has not. Um, have you um, ever heard of the word communist? No. 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 Have you ever heard of the word dem democracy or democrat? No. Yes. What about, what do you know about democracy? Democracy means everybody is the same. Among those we interviewed on Cairo streets, Ahmed was exceptionally well informed. More typical of the attitude we met with everywhere was that of Mohammed, a waiter. The regime of Ismail Sidki Pasha, since succeeded as Prime Minister by Fahmi al nakrachi was under considerable attack and criticism at the time, and I asked Mohammed what he thought about it. How do you feel about the government in Egypt today? The government of Sidki Pasha? Says we don't care at all in all these troubles, we don't participate in these troubles and we don't hear anything about it and we don't want to hear anything about it. I asked Mrs. Hitchman, long an observer of Egyptian affairs, why so many of the people shied away from any kind of political thought or expression. They are afraid. They are afraid of every kind of authority. They know that every time they come in contact with authority, they are unhappy. So they are afraid of doctors, they are afraid of policemen, they are afraid of the government, they are afraid of everything. The ignorance which lay like a pall over the people was not confined to any particular district. It should be borne in mind that these recordings were made not in a backwoods area, in Tobacco Road country, but on the streets of the biggest city in Africa, a modernized, busy city which for centuries has had access to the best of Eastern and Western culture. In the hope that samplings made thus far were not entirely representative of the Egyptian man in the street, I tried again in still another district. The first man here was a worker, father of two children, sole support of his mother and father. He earned a dollar a day. In the following recording, you will hear the man say, in answer to a question, throughout the Middle East, this means no. Has this man uh, ever been outside of Cairo? Never. Does he read? He doesn't read, he doesn't write. Has he ever seen a moving picture? No, no, he said. Has he ever heard a radio? He says he listens to music from the Egyptian state broadcasting, but not to the news. On his own radio? Does he own a radio? You look at me with the expression which means a, what a foolish question. It is, because they hear the radio in that way. They hang a radio very high up the ceiling of the cafe, and it's kept open night and day, so everybody hears the radio. I see. There are very few home sets here. They just can't dream of it. They haven't got enough money to buy clothes. How could they buy radios? We next talked to a man who said his home was four miles from the Nile. And I asked when he had last seen the river. He hasn't seen the Nile for the last eight years. That's four miles away and he hasn't seen it in eight years. No, fine. I don't want to let this boy go away. Uh, I'd like to talk to him. Has he ever gone to school? Roth fi madrasa abadan? Roth to tlaht. Kam yom aad hinak. Igi shari. He went only for two months to school and then he left. How long ago was that? Uh, emta. Zama? Balik tiir. Yeah. Balik gitalat tini. Oh, three years ago. 
I see. How old is he now? He claims he's 16. He looks about uh, 13, doesn't he? Yes. But generally, they don't know their age. An airplane passed overhead a moment later, and I asked the boy whether he'd like to fly in one. At first he said no, and then he said, tomorrow, if I work for Hitler, maybe I'll ride a plane. How did he hear about Hitler? Well, during the war. Yeah. Uh, does he know Hitler's dead? It's all if Hitler's Hitler Yeah? It's all if Hitler's Nobody ever told him that Hitler is dead. Does he know who won the war? Min kasa vil harb bar. Some people say the British, some people say Hitler. I see. And uh, um, has he ever thought he would like to find out really who won the war? Is he curious to know? It took some time to make the boy understand this last question. And in the process, a man of about 35 who was standing nearby, a cemetery caretaker, took part in the discussion. Finally, they both answered it. The boy says he doesn't care. And the other man, the other caretaker, says, well, in the end, Hitler will win. In the end, Hitler will win? Yes. George Polk noticed that the caretaker had an eye infection, and he informed me that 90% of Egyptians suffer from eye diseases, and that the incidence of blindness is very high. I asked Mrs. Hitchman to ask the Arab what he was doing about his eye. I said, well, but do, why don't you go to some clinic or something? He says, I have no money. Yeah, he'd be afraid of going blind. So many persons are blind here. You see them wandering in the streets. So many persons are blind. So what should I do? God is there, and if God wants me to be blind, I'll be blind. The statement, God is there, was accompanied by a gesture of pointing to heaven. The government of Sidki Pasha last summer had one absorbing internal preoccupation, and it was not that of alleviating the poverty or sickness of its people. It was the hounding of liberals. The editor of the principal newspaper of the Wafda, an opposition but not leftist political party, was arrested. So was the Greek millionaire Zabini, known to be sympathetic to the anti-royalist movement in his home country. Eleven cultural, scientific, educational, and labor associations were suspended, Hundreds of people were jailed for weeks without charges. Months later, on November 8th, the New York Times reported from Cairo, and I'm quoting, the Red Scare in Egypt has passed off without proof of the existence of a communist organization. Nearly all persons arrested have been released. The roundup resulted in the detention of an assorted lot of intellectuals, social reformers, labor leaders, and foreigners. Some would be described outside Egypt as liberals or socialists. But those arrested included some who were plainly capitalists, including millionaires. Others appeared to be simply opponents of the government. End of quote. At the time we were in Egypt, three months before that dispatch appeared, the assorted lot of intellectuals was in jail. And it seemed to me that the Egyptian people themselves were behind bars, behind the bars of their own ignorance. If there was any awareness of the concept of one world in ordinary Egyptian life, it must have been as rare as a well-fed child, as rare as a well-paid worker, as rare as a literate farmer. We left Cairo for India at dawn one morning on a converted York bomber and flew across the glaring deserts of Transjordan, Syria, and Iraq. Geographically, this was the middle of the Middle East. Socially, in point of progress, it was the Middle Ages. The great and terrible bond among these many countries stretching all the way from the mouth of the Nile to the mouth of the Ganges is rank poverty, disease, abysmal ignorance. We crossed the vast swamplands lying between the Euphrates and Tigris rivers and landed at the sizzling river port of Basra to refuel. Then we took off again and flew out over the Persian Gulf. The waters of the Gulf were a sickly, bleached out blue. For nearly a thousand miles, we followed the dry, rugged west coast of Iran, and as night fell, we were droning over the Arabian Sea. In the middle of the evening, we landed at Karachi, India, a port well known to American soldiers who served in the Far East. On 
the day that we were to take our recorder on the street so that you might hear the voices of Indians, religious rioting broke out between Hindus and Muslims and our movements were blocked. In Calcutta, we found martial law when we arrived. We had to watch our step to avoid treading literally on the corpses of slain rioters. We could get no transportation to carry our recording equipment, no batteries to run it. And without recordings, whereby you could hear directly from more than a few Indian people, it would be arrogant to comment upon a situation so complex that men who have given years to the study of India's problems shrug their shoulders when you ask them about prospects of unity within any reasonable time. India, as you know, is a land divided by hundreds of languages, religions, castes, and customs. Its political problems at the moment are as difficult as those of almost any trouble spot in the world. Instead of attempting to present any rounded picture of the turbulent Indian scene as it existed last summer, we will limit our report to an interview with the one Indian leader of world renown available to our microphone during the period of our visit. He is Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru, Minister of External Affairs and Commonwealth Relations. We recorded Mr. Nehru in the modest home of his nephew. He was wearing the round white cap of the Indian National Congress Party. His sensitive face was drawn and sober. For almost an hour, we talked on a wide variety of subjects. First, about Wendell Wilkie, whose book One World he said he had read in prison while under detention by the British for political reasons in 1942. We then discussed the international situation, which at that time was badly inflamed. I asked what he considered the greatest threat to the peace. Well, I should say the greatest single threat at the present moment is the growing conflict between uh, the, uh, America and England on the one side, if you like to put them together, and the Soviet Union on the other. That is the biggest threat. I believe that both parties are to blame for it. Blame in the present, blame in the past, because you can't, you can't forget the past, you can't get rid of the past. Obviously, you can't ask others to do what you are not doing yourself. And one finds repeatedly on both sides of this, whether it is Russia on the one hand or uh, other countries, Western countries, that they have done things which were wrong. And they have blamed the other party for doing the same thing, more or less. Mr. Nehru spoke at length of India's problems, which he said were not formed suddenly, but were the accumulation of more than a hundred years. He had bitter words for the treatment of Indians in the Union of South Africa, whose racial policy he called, quote, exactly on a par with Nazi doctrine, unquote. I asked him whether there was goodwill in India for the United States, and he replied, America is a country which attracts, for many reasons, at any rate, it has attracted me, although unfortunately I have never succeeded in reaching there yet. It is a vital country, a growing country, a frank country. And it hasn't got all the legacy of, of past ages which drags other countries down, complexes created. On the other hand, one has a certain sense, at any rate I have, of a certain roughness and toughness. And a strange mixture of democracy and the highest pretensions uh, to freedom and the denial of that freedom, say, among the near to, to the Negroes in America. That question often troubles us because, well, we ourselves in this country have been guilty in the past, in past ages, of denying freedom to large numbers of our own people. And we are suffering for that. And I think one of the causes of our downfall in India has been the fact that we tried to suppress large numbers of our own people in the past, get rid of that completely. And when we see that happening elsewhere, especially in a very advanced country like, like America, which attracts us so much, it is a painful thought. And uh, it colors our opinions about those American declarations of freedom. 
apparently freedom is meant for particular groups, not for all. But if we think of freedom for one world, then all this racialism and uh, one race or one nation or one country being fundamentally superior to another, that has to be given up. From the vantage point of this pleasant home in New Delhi, a city whose appearance suggests an American university campus more than an Asiatic government center, it was hard for me to imagine the vast Indian subcontinent of 700,000 villages stretching away to all compass points, to sense the stupendous poverty and struggle of its nearly 400 million people. These masses, like the relatively small population of Egypt, come within the bleak area of humanity that we call backward. Backward because of no inherent lacks, but because of economic stagnation and total absence of opportunity. I asked Pandit Nehru what recommendations he would make toward achieving the cooperative and united world of which Wendell Wilkie spoke, and he replied, You cannot cooperate with people who are not free and who are suffering from all manner of complexes, of fear and the rest. Therefore, those countries who have power and influence in the world today should themselves give the lead in this matter and work out as rapidly as possible the ideal of, call it the four freedoms or what you like, that no, no nation, no people should be subjected to another. No race should be considered an inferior race as a race. And that, that uh, uh, the only way really for even the most advanced nations to carry on in the future is for backward nations to come up, to remove poverty, and to cooperate in the task of raising humanity as a whole and not concentrate so much on a particular area of it. If that viewpoint is adopted and acted up to, perhaps not wholly, but anyway, in a large measure, then maybe the whole psychological atmosphere of the world will change. Then, probably, we'd move much more rapidly to the one world of which Wendell Wilkie talked. Mr. Nehru was looking right at America and our principal allies when he spoke of countries who have power and influence in the world today taking the lead and working out the four freedoms. Perhaps he had even defined a fifth freedom. Freedom from subjugation, prejudice, discrimination. That no, no nation, no people should be subjected to another. No race should be considered an inferior race as a race. A simple formula that but one that would make life more livable for three out of every four people alive on this earth today. have been listening to Norman Corwin, first winner of the Wendell Wilkie One World Flight Award, in the eighth of a series of broadcasts based on his recent 37,000-mile global tour. All recorded voices heard on this broadcast were transcribed in Egypt and India. Next week at the same time, One World Flight visits China and Japan. Tonight's musical score was composed and directed by Alexander Semler. Guy Della Chapa was associate director. This is Lee Vines, and this is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.